My name is Chris. The event is being presented by Kevin Street Library. Without further ado, let me hand you over to today's speaker, Dr. Owen Odunoku. Owen? Hi, everyone. How are you? You're all very welcome. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, before I start, I just want to um, make available in the chat a, a list of resources, essentially, uh, to help if anyone wants to do their own, if anyone's new to doing their own kind of family or local history research, um, it's a PDF. So I'm just going to upload that and feel free to um, feel free to download that for yourselves. So that should appear in the chat box now in a second. OK, so I'm going to uh, share my screen and we'll get started. OK, so. Um, the first thing I should say is that uh, Michael O'Donoghue is my uh, great grandfather, um, and that's how I came across him. And um, yeah, so we're, uh, the purpose of the talk then is to um, explore aspects of uh, the local and social history of Dublin, including Kevin Street, via an examination of the life and career of Sergeant Michael O'Donoghue of the DMP, um, while showcasing along the way uh, sources, primary sources for genealogical or local history research that um, you as members of the audience might be interested in using yourselves, okay? So that's really the aim of, of today's, uh, of today's uh, talk. So I'm gonna start with Michael's background and that, um, that gives us um, an opportunity to introduce some of the uh, main um, sources for uh, Irish family history research and um, for those who aren't familiar. So um, I would always been, begin with family tradition where it's available. So we had a family tradition that Michael, um, he was, his family was linked to somewhere around the North Wexford border, uh, a place called Kyle and Aaron. It's uh, near the border with Wicklow. Um, but this didn't really fit with what we, um, what we could find in paper. So um, yeah, uh, the next stop was to go back to uh, the census records. Um, we had a family tradition that Michael lived in Kevin Street um, in, a, in a large building. Um, my, my grandfather had, uh, had referred to it as seventh heaven. He was only a child um, when Michael died and it had seven floors. Um, so he was up on the top floor, seventh heaven. Um, so the 1901 and 1911 census records actually place Michael's birth in County Wicklow. So this presented a little bit of a, a challenge for us. Um, so I was able to do some digging on this and um, I found uh, Michael, the name of Michael's uh, parents um, in his marriage records. Um, so his civil marriage record, um, that named his father Thomas, and we were very lucky that his uh, church marriage record um, named his mother as well, Sarah Darcy. So I was able to follow up on that and find um, Thomas Donoghue and Sarah Darcy, and they lived in uh, Moyne in um, County Wicklow. And uh, I was actually able to find the, the, the location where they lived, um, and that is the picture um, on screen there. It's actually... Um, I suspect the largest part of that building is probably later in their lives, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, but the, the earlier, the, the kind of sheds would probably be from around the time, uh, from around the 1850s, I guess. Um, so yeah, I was able to find where, where they were living. That, uh, that property, I have a picture of it uh, from myhome.ie because it went up for sale recently. So somebody bought that for a uh, hundred grand. Um, so that's nice. Um, yeah, so Michael's mother's family then, um, they, uh, Sarah Darcy, uh, her family were from uh, North Wexford, from a, a townland called Ahullan, and that's very near Kyle and Aaron. So that explained that, but it took a while to get back there. Um, so again, using Griffith's valuation land records and the parish registers. So Michael's early life then, um, his, his father's family who lived in Moyne, in, in, in the picture you can see, um, they, they were tenant farmers. Um, his his uh, grandfather was renting about 20 acres of land not the best land uh, but not terrible land either um, a little mountainous and um, probably good for grazing um, where his mother's family seemed to have had a, a larger uh, tenant farm at the time and it would have been uh, better better quality land um, so yeah Michael was baptized in 1848 and unfortunately he had a, a, what we can only assume was a bit of childhood trauma um, when his uh, mother, uh, Sarah, died age 27 and joined the 27 Club alongside Jimi Hendrix and the like. Um, so that was in 1853, just kind of towards the end of the famine. Um, 
So his father then, uh, Thomas, remarried, um, and he, he remarried a woman called Hannah Byrne um, from up the road in Askana Gap um, in County Wicklow. It's about a mile up the road from mine. Um, and you'll notice there uh, the spellings are of, of the surname, uh, of Thomas' surname, are, are different. Um, different records had have preserved different spellings of the surname. Just something to be aware of. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of Michael's background. So kind of... Uh, relatively poor but not terribly poor rural family um tenant farmers so uh michael joins uh the dmp then so um we had a family tradition that he was a police sergeant um, and that as i said he lived in a large house on kevin street we also had a family tradition that he worked in the dublin cattle market the smithfield cattle market like his work kind of brought him there and um, but we didn't really understand the context for that um, so I was able to use uh, the Dublin Metropolitan Police General Register, um, which is digitized by UCD and hosted online by UCD, um, to uh, locate his um, service record, essentially. Um, so what this tells us, and there's a, a picture of it there at the, at the bottom of the slide, bottom of your, of your screen, um, it tells us his name, his religion was Roman Catholic, his age when joining, um, his height, uh, his the job before he joined, and then his native parish, etc. Um, and then there's more. Uh, you get the person who gave him a reference, and then it'll tell you um, further along. It'll tell you what divisions of the force he was in and uh, his pay, etc. So there's a little bit of a problem here, in that um, this Michael uh, number six nine oh nine in the in the register is our guy, in that he's the only Michael, don't know who or any variant of that name who became sergeant, but. Um, surprisingly, he doesn't give his native parish as Hackettstown and the townland of Moyne in Wicklow, um, which was a little troubling um, at first. Uh, similarly, his, he joined in 1866, and his, um, his age uh, in this doesn't reflect that. Uh, he, he should be down as 17, um, kind of almost 18, um, and he's down as 21. So... As you'll see over the course of this talk, we do have the right guy, um, but this was a bit troubling at the start. And the only thing I can really put this down to is that um, Michael did what I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with doing when you're in your late, when you're 17, going on 18, and you don't have access to do what you want to do because you're not 18 yet. You're not just going to say you're 18. You're going to say, hey, I'm 21. Add the few years, they won't question you. So um, I think that's probably what's going on here. So, um, yeah, uh, Michael had a, a recorded height of uh, five foot ten um, and three eighths, because those three eighths are important. Um, and he gave his uh, occupation as a labourer and uh, his native parish as uh, Arklow. And he may well have lived there at the time, or perhaps he was actually born there, even though the family were from from mine. Um, it's not one hundred percent clear to me. He obtained a reference from James Redmond. Uh, he was the Arklow parish priest. He is responsible for the construction of uh, Saint Mary, Saints Mary and Peter uh, Church in Arklow. He was also Archdeacon of Glendalough. He's related to another Redmond who was involved in 1798. And um, yeah, when Michael joins the force, he is recruited to A Division, which is the Cavalry Division, and they are stationed in Kevin Street. So just to give you a bit of uh, an introduction to the Dublin Metropolitan Police. So this, uh, this police force was introduced in 1836 by the Bill for Improving the Police in the District of the Dublin Metropol uh, Metro Metropolis. Um, superseding, uh, yeah, it superseded the Night Watchman, which was an 18th century, but probably went back earlier, um, system where you'd have uh, men basically um, trained to keep peace, um, especially at night. Um, so yeah, it, it superseded... Uh, those individuals and a few earlier attempts to uh, legislate for a successful uh, police force. One of them was in 1786. Um, there had been kind of economic recession, food shortages, and uh, a rise in crime at the time. And um, it was thought, okay, well, the government needed to step in and develop a, a, a I suppose, a more robust police force um, than the Watchmen. Um, but that first attempt failed. And then there were subsequent acts over time. But the Dublin Metropolitan Police, as we really know them, um, uh, I suppose, came into formation when the bill I just mentioned became the Dublin Police Act in 1836. 
Now, the purpose of this uh, police force then, according to the act, was to act as constables uh, for preserving the peace and preventing robberies and other felonies and apprehending offenders against the peace. So it was very much what you'd expect, peacekeeping in terms of, uh, you know, stopping people committing crimes in in an urban environment. Um, But the act also uh, shows concern for apprehending the the loose and idle and disorderly persons of society and and, uh, anticipates remiss or neglect constables as well. So it talks about um, basically uh, publicans uh, getting fined if they harbour uh, or entertain someone from the from the force and um, while well, they're meant to be on duty you know so this is obviously uh something that the um the powers that be were worried about and uh, I, th- I think it i think a lot of people were dismissed for this kind of behavior so you know part of me is quite critical and go yeah of course they think that um you know the the conservative establishment of the day but they they weren't wrong um apparently so there you go um so yeah the uh over time, then um, the act, uh, the act was, um, I suppose, followed up with uh, another act, so the Dublin Police Act in 1842, um, and this uh, just made some adjustments to the force. The idea was, uh, it, they they said it was for improving the Dublin Police, and it followed in line with uh, similar improvements made in London. Um, and it was actually in 1842 that uh, G Division, the Detective Division, um, was established uh, because of that act. And um, if you have a look there um, at the um, the pictures on the, on the screen um, at the very top you have um, a baton and a I suppose a signal clapper a noisemaker um, from the National Museum of Ireland and um, they were apparently uh, belonging to watchmen um, so presumably the watchman would uh, you know apprehend somebody with the baton and then uh, sound the clapper to draw attention and maybe get help so um, there's a, a great book if people are interested in the history of uh, the DMP. Um, it's by Anastasia uh, Dukova. Um, it's called The History of the Dublin Metropolitan Police and um, its Colonial Legacy. Um, and uh, Anastasia says uh, the first Dublin Bobby was a country lad uh, over five feet and nine inches tall, broad in the chest, armed with a baton and a myriad of rules and regulations. And I think that kind of fits what we saw with Michael. If we look at his, um, we, we look at his background and his entry into the, the register, he is a country lad. Um, he happens to be, he was literate and under 26. That's also a requirement. Um, and uh, the chest requirement, for whatever reason, you have to be 36 inches in the chest. Um, if Michael had a chest anything like mine, uh, he'd probably draw two salaries. So fair, fair play. Um, yeah, the, I had a look at this and I, I couldn't, um, I, I could find that there was a rule about um, being under 26 to get in uh, into, the, into the force. Um, but I couldn't see uh, anything um, that confirmed that uh, you had to be 18 to fit with my theory for why um, Michael might have lied about his age in, in, um, upon joining in, um, in, in the register. And uh, so I had a look around the register and I couldn't see around the time of the decades around Michael, I couldn't see anyone um, who was younger than 18. So presumably, yeah, you had to be 18. Um, I did find, however, when I was doing that, um, I found uh, someone who was 27. And I can't explain why they were allowed in at 27. Um, And I also found uh, a few people, 29, 33 and 35, who were let in. But there's there's obvious reasons for that in that they were already servicemen. Uh, The 29-year-old, I think, was in the army. And the 33 and 35-year-old were former DMP uh, men who had obviously left or possibly been dismissed for something but had, had come back i presume had left more likely um and i've given you on the side there i've given you uh, snippets of some of some of their names just showing the the ages so you have uh, brian murphy there 27 he was a laborer so i don't know why he got in at 27 and then we have um, a couple of lads 33 and 35 under that um yeah so in terms of the uh, structure of the DMP, then um, the divisions were largely drew, uh, were mainly uh, geographical in their organisation, but a little bit of a, a functional definition as well. So um, A division was uh, was known as Castle, and that had its station at Kevin Street uh, Upper, and that's actually where the the cavalry, um, the mounted police, um, were headquartered. Um, so that Castle kind of deals with the I suppose southwest of, of the city centre. 
Um, B division uh, was known as college, and that's um, the southeast of the, of the city centre. Um, C division was Rotunda, so that's uh, northeast, uh, and their, their station was at Store Street. Um, D division was known as Barrack, and that's, um, their station was at Green Street, and that was on the, uh, the north uh, west of, of the city centre. Um, later, uh, over, over the, the 19th century, uh, extra divisions were added. Uh, originally, it was just the four. Um, so E Division um, crops up later, uh, and that's known as Donnybrook. And um, that covers kind of uh, the suburbs around Donnybrook, Rathmines, and they, a station in Rathmines. And um, these stations, by the way, are what they were in the 1890s. And um, yeah, F Division then uh, was um, responsible for Kingstown, uh, Dunleary. And they had uh, their station at Georgia Street Upper in Dunleary or Kingstown at the time. And as I said, uh, G Division or the Detective Division was established in 1842 and um, they were at Dublin Castle on Exchange Court. OK, so having a look at the barracks at Kevin Street. Well, um, so the Dublin barracks or sorry, the, the DMP barracks at uh, Kevin Street, first of all, is not the first time that, that there was a uh, let's say a police presence, um, and I use the term slightly lightly, um, on Kevin Street. Um, there's evidence that there was a watch house on Kevin Street um, in the early um, 18th century. Um, this was attacked by rioters who were attempting to free prisoners. That happened on the 13th of April, 1729, and the army were deployed against those protesters. So although the watchmen weren't exactly police they were an analogous or relatively analogous institution and forerunner so um interesting to note that somewhere on kevin street I'm not sure exactly where there was a watch house um but it wasn't in the site of the current barracks i would think and um, because um unless it was on the gate of it uh, because the um the site of the the barracks itself was um a bishop's palace and that is medieval in uh, origin it's from the late 12th century um, that ceased to have been uh, a palace in 1806, apparently. I did see one author say 1804, um, but 1806 seems good to me. Um, so this was the headquarters, as I said, for the cavalry division, but it was also the main barracks in Dublin for the DMP. So when new candidates joined the DMP, um, they were first made... Uh, what we call supernumeraries. So kind of, uh, this is a term I'm surprised universities haven't used actually. Uh, it means kind of uh, not staff, kind of surplus to requirement, but you know, yeah, you're kind of staff doing work. So um, adjunct, if you like, um, in training. Um, so yeah, they were first made uh, supernumeraries and they were housed and trained in Kevin Street headquarters. So um, in with this, they were supplied with their own clothing and equipment. Um, my favorite uh, from the list of items was a book on cruelty to animals. Seems a bit weird, except there was, as we'll find out later, um, or we'll touch on later, there was a lot of animals in the city at the time. There was livestock coming up and, uh, you know, a lot of horses being used for, for transport, etc. So there's quite a lot of, uh, a lot of animals around. Um, but as, as they pro progressed, uh, unlike the, the London police, they actually had to buy their own boots and then their own watch. Um, so, yeah, that was an interesting one. Uh, I presume save your money and don't spend it on drinking or whatever. Um, days were filled with schooling and drilling um, and they were divided by meals, obviously. Um, and yeah, in order to kind of qualify and become a, a constable of the of the third class, you needed to um, have a knowledge of the instructions and the, the legislation. You need to, um, you know, uh, be able to do your drills and have qualifications in, in the three oars. As, as we say, uh, writing, reading, and arithmetic, and spelling as well, apparently. So three hours doesn't cut the grade, I'm afraid. Um, life was highly uh, regulated for, for uh, candidates and, and for uh, qualified uh, policemen. Um, the candidates were kind of uh, forbidden from uh, messing around, playing jokes on one another. Um, they're forbidden from cursing, any kind of behavior like that. Um, there are also strict rules on personal hygiene, uh, like when they had to change their shirts and stuff. So every Thursday and every Sunday they had to change a shirt. Um, so yeah, quite interesting. Um, marriages were also impacted. Um, so uh, the first thing, like you had to actually have um, a few years of service. If you weren't married going into the force, you had to have a few years of service uh, behind you before you were kind of given permission to marry. Um, and when you uh, did get married, often um, in both the DMP and, and the RIC, 
um, the families would sometimes live on the barracks. Um, not, not always. Um, but DMP men could be dismissed for quarreling with their wives um, or for having poorly kept residences or, you know, just for falling behind in their rent payments because they wouldn't last today um, or for having children uh, regularly absent from school. So basically you had to have upstanding character. Um, Sorry, Owen, just uh, we yeah. have a question in from Patsy. Could you say the name of the book of the Dublin his the history of the Dublin police again? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's on the book list, um, but it's Anastasia Dukova. It's the history of the Dublin Metropolitan Police and its colonial legacy. So oh, a, lot, a, a lot of what I have here is actually coming from, uh, I think, the third, third chapter in that. Um, if you do a Google search for that, you might, uh, you might find it. Okay, and just to let people know uh, that if they can't open the PDF that's in the chat, we're going mm -hmm. to be emailing it to people later. So I think some people are having trouble, but we'll send it on to your email addresses. So, Perfect. Sorry to let you carry on. No, no, thanks a million. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so as I said uh, as well, you had to get permission. Um, you, you'd enter the force often as a single person, and then if you wanted to marry, you'd have to get permission after a few years' service. Um, if you didn't live on the barracks, you were kind of expected to have enough money to house yourself and your wife. And interestingly, uh, DMP men who visited sex workers were treated more leniently in, <coughs> pardon, in some cases than those who married without permission, which is, uh, yeah, interesting. I mean, not that I think there's anything wrong with either of those things, but it, it shows the priorities of the people at the time. Okay. Right, uh, moving on. So that's kind of what the barracks were like and the barracks are on Upper Kevin Street. So moving down to Lower Kevin Street or over to Lower Kevin Street, we'll have a look at what that was like in the 19th century. So um, yeah, in the 1830s, it was a busy commercial thoroughfare. There was a lot of uh, uh, retail and, and manufacturing, small scale manufacturing on the street. Um, so you'd have a lot of carts coming, uh, obviously horse-drawn carts, and they'd come to collect things like leather, timber, nails, hay, bones, iron, rags, seeds, delf, glass, and casks, all of these things. Um, about uh, Of the 64 commercial premises, about a, a quarter of them served alcohol. And um, I think it was Jimmy Robinson suggested that this had to do with the number of um, cartiers uh, on the street. Um, I, yeah, maybe cartiers drank more. I don't know. Uh, I would have thought, you know, everyone was probably doing it. <coughs> Pardon. Um, because of all the car tiers, uh, there was a coachsmith, um, Hugh Rogers. He was at number 50. Uh, there was also a way station. So a way station was a place where um, you could go to get the, uh, the weight of goods uh, measured. And the idea was to kind of prevent fraud by the car tiers who might have, uh, you know, helped themselves to a percentage of the load. Um, there was also a charter school. And um, the charter school, there was, there was a lot of kind of youth labor um, on the street. Um, so that kind of operated with a backdrop of, of, of this happening. And, um, you know, there's, there's evidence that the schoolmaster would be trying to encourage um, children and families not to go down that route and to, to value education so that they weren't just laboring. Um, later in the middle of the century, uh, much of the street then was used as tenement accommodation. Um, but a lot of the commercial uh, premises kind of remained or the same, the same kind of industries remained. So you had things like butter makers, wool sellers, grocers, iron merchants, you had a saddler. Um, so if anyone's interested in doing more work on the local history, there's a couple of sources that are particularly um, relevant here. Um, you have the directories like Tom's, which list uh, the addresses and what was going on in each address. So, you know, it'd be nine Lower Kevin Street, you know, provision dealer or whatever. Um, you also have uh, maps, um, which can help you locate the actual buildings or the position of where the buildings would be if they've been replaced and um electoral rolls as well they kick in kind of at the very end of the century and into the early 20th century um so you can see who occupied different uh, different houses so they're they're useful um and they're all on your pdf our links to them are on your pdf okay so michael then uh, he moves out of the barracks on upper kevin street and he moves all the way over to lower kevin street adventurous um I just found Dublin and liked it, I'd say. Uh, I'm the officer. I want to go down to Wicklow. Um, so, yeah, um, there was an expectation then that living outside the barracks, um, DM, 
uh, DMP men needed to be near the station. So the figure I've seen is a quarter mile away. Um, so Michael actually marries a local, uh, a woman called Catherine Needham, Needham um, in 1872. Um, and her residence um, is her father's house, which is uh, at 9 Lower Kevin Street, the house where Michael would come to live. Um, at the time of the marriage, Michael is actually resident in the Kevin Street barracks. Um, and just uh, for those of the family who are, might be here, uh, his, Michael's father, Thomas, was actually in London at the time. Um, so Catherine um, is, uh, she's the daughter of a provision dealer named John Needham. Um, and as I said, that's 9 Lower Kevin Street. Um, you, can, uh, you can find him in Tom's directory. So he's obviously just, he has a shop, um, doing well for himself. Um, in some of the uh, years of uh, Tom's, his name is mistranscribed or misprinted um, as John Whedon. So I, I can, I'm guessing we're talking about a, a written, handwritten record there where the W or where the N was uh, read as a W by somebody. Um, and then it was printed up as a directory. And um, that's what I would expect. Uh, okay, so yeah, I'm assuming Michael moved into Nine Lower Kevin Street when he got married, but not 100% sure. Um, but it was certainly before 1883, because there is a, an article in the Freeman's Journal in 1883, um, where a man dies suddenly um, and unexpectedly. And he had been lodging in the same house, um, nine, Lower Kevin Street, as Sergeant Michael Dunahoo at the time. So that kind of suggests to me that Michael, certainly at that stage, was living in obviously living in nine Lower Kevin Street and was probably renting from his father-in-law um, with his, 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 uh, his wife. So in terms of when Michael took ownership of, of the house, well, uh, John Needham, the, the provision dealer, he died in 1891. I would, I would think that that is when Michael took ownership, um, though, his, though John's wife, Mary, uh, only died in 1904. Um, so she's in the 1901 census. And again, the automatic assumption there is that the man, the senior man is the head of the household. So I'm, I'm, I would think that Michael probably took possession in 1891. Uh, Catherine then herself, uh, Michael's wife dies uh, a year after her mother in 1905. Um, and if anyone's wondering where this building, Nine Lower Cabin Street was, um, it was uh, beside Boujum. So uh, it's, it's the building no longer exists. Um, but it's, it's in that location. And I will show you how we figure that out. So this might be useful for people. Um, there's a whole bunch of old maps, OS maps. Um, UCD have a bunch of them up. Um, and again, this is in your, in your sources uh, pack. Um, yeah, this is Lower Kevin Street and Upper Kevin Street here. And you can cross-reference a map like this with, um, with a directory like Tom's. And um, so working from... Um, just the the bottom right corner, the crossroads there of um, Wexford Street uh, and Kevin Street. Working across, um, you can count uh, the numbers of, of buildings and the lanes. And barring one small difference um, on the second block, I think that where the red star is is probably where Nine Lower Kevin Street was. Might be one one out. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure that's where it was. Now, this map isn't uh, exactly uh, contempor uh, contemporaneous with, um, with the directory. There's a few years between them, but they're roughly contemporaneous. So that's how you do that, if anyone's interested. And you can see the way station um, halfway down the street as well, across from the Dublin Technical School. Um, it's in the middle of the road, the weighing machine. And over on the other side, you can see the police barracks where I've put a blue star. So he didn't have very far to walk. Clever man. Okay, so looking at Michael's early career then, um, yeah, the, the main sources for this are the DMP General Register, which you mightn't think you can get a lot out of, but you actually can, even though it's a few columns, and um, newspaper records. And we were extremely fortunate in the family to have very rich records in the newspapers, um, presumably because he was a sergeant. I, I'd say that's why he got named um, so many times. Um, so if you have a look, if you go onto the UCD um, uh, UCD hosted DMP General Register, uh, you'll be confronted with a, a digital um, image like this, where you'll have the, the full register um, on both sides open like a book. So you have your verso on the left and your recto on, on the right, um, and you can zoom in into this. 
And um, so if we follow Michael's entry, and you've seen the start of that on an earlier slide, um, you can go follow along uh, the row to the different columns, and we can see what divisions um, he was attached to and at what dates he was attached. To. So he started off in the cavalry division in, in A um, in 1866, then he moved to D, D division for uh, what a, a month, and then B division. Um, then he seems to have been going to move into E division, but that was cancelled. So I don't know if he went there and you know was was transferred back or or what the story was. And then eventually he ends up back in A division. So looking at this, um, what we're really seeing is if you cross reference this with his pay and his ranks column, what we're seeing is uh, Michael moved from A division for a promotion. So he moved from Kevin Street um, over to uh, to um, D division. Um, in order to uh, get, get a role as acting sergeant. Um, and then he seems to move um, to B division. And then uh, when he's in B division, he gets uh, promoted to sergeant. Um, and that may have coincided with that cancelled move to E division as well. Um, so yeah, and then later in his, his, his career, he, he moves back to A division as a sergeant. Uh, in terms of his pay, um, you can see he starts off, well, we can't see the very start. I think he start, probably starts off on third class, then goes to second class. So there's an improvement. Um, then third rate, fourth rate. I th I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think fourth rate might be a, a drop in pay from third rate. Um, so I wonder what happened there. Then he seems to go back to third rate. Uh, that would have been when Michael was actually 21, even though he was meant to be older. Um, so maybe it was just party and I don't know um and then yeah he he, uh, he after after that blip he seems to rise in his uh, in his uh, pay rates and um then in 1886 he's earning uh one pound what is it, 18 shillings and, and eight pence um which would have bought you three stones of wool if you were into buying wool in in 1880 and um, probably has a modern purchasing power probably somewhere around 200 pounds sterling it's very difficult to, and you know those kind of calculations with inflation aren't very accurate they depend on too many variables but probably something around there okay so that's what we can get from the dmp register quite a bit um, and by cross-referencing michael's attachment to different divisions and the dates we can um we can cross-reference that with newspaper articles and we can actually um get an insight into some of the incidents he was involved in so uh, this first one is, is quite, actually the first two are quite distressing. They're domestic violence in, incidents. Um, and in, in this first one, um, basically uh, Michael is on, on the beat, presumably with uh, another constable, Maguire. And um, yeah, the two of them cross a woman who's lying in the street bleeding and they bring her to hospital, to the Mead hospital. Um, she makes a complaint against her husband. Um, I, I, they're from Coal Alley, which is in the Liberties just off Mead Street. And uh, the, the policemen go to the home and um, the other policeman, Maguire, um, basically when, when they arrive, they're confronted by, by the husband and the husband says, police be damned. And then he said uh, he cut off the head of any bloody policeman who went in there into the house, you know. And then um, he said that he was going to do away with his wife, presumably for, for um, you know, contacting the police. Um, so Maguire goes up to the door and... Um, he, he goes to get in, into the door and he gets into a scuffle with this chap and the chap pulls a razor blade and seems to cut his neck. So they're, they're, um, they're kind of entwined for a minute and then um, I think the, the perpetrator gets knocked down and he's going to get back up and then Michael steps in, probably on the side, just being like, okay, I'll leave you to it. Um, but he steps in and he knocks him down then. Um, so they they do actually, uh, they, they um, arrest the guy and he gets taken to court and, and gets um, gets prosecuted um, in, in that case. Um, but pretty awful stuff um, sort of suggests, like it's obviously obviously domestic violence um, and violence against the police, um, possibly alcoholism. Like they don't mention it in this case. And maybe that's a, a bit of a sign that it wasn't there. But to me, those, those statements are really strange, like police be damned and I'll cut the head off anyone. You know, uh, that strikes me as possibly somebody who had a bit to drink but maybe just as infuriated or having a breakdown and um, pretty pretty awful stuff anyway um the life of a bobby um then there's another another incident um this one's even kind of more upsetting um the the violence is is worse uh, i i suppose um or certainly more graphic in, in how it's presented um but also the the way that the court dealt with it is quite quite upsetting 
Um, so here, um, Michael uh, prosecutes a husband who was whipping his wife down Bolton Street. Um, and he was whipping her because she was drinking. And she was drinking, apparently, because they'd lost a child or she'd lost a child. Um, and uh, so Michael brings, brings this chap to court to prosecute him. Uh, the judge, Mr. Keyes, will come across him again later. Um, he pretty much says that, uh, well, well, the, wife, that, the wife's uh, behaviour, sure, that would anger any man, you know? Um, awful stuff, really. Um, and then there's, there's a bit, I'd actually like a bit of input from people on this one. Um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, read out a bit of this. Um, uh, so yeah, Mr. Keyes uh, says, it is very likely that she got just what she deserved. Uh, that's the judge. Um, Sergeant Donahue said the prisoner's wife was not present to prosecute, although she had made a very bitter complaint in the station. So I don't know how to read that. I don't know if Michael is kind of having a go at the judge saying, yeah, look, she's not on trial here. Um, but her complaint was serious. Or if he's saying, yeah, well, she's not here to prosecute, but we could. And uh, she did make a very bitter complaint. It's really hard to read. Um, the word although is possibly crucial to it. And I don't know if we're talking about, you know, the, the journalists editorializing that or if we're talking about actual direct speech. I'm probably leaning towards the former, but I'm hardly objective on the issue. Um, so it'd be interesting maybe in the Q&A later to, if anyone has a thought on that. Um, but I, I think what this really shows anyway is, um, oh, the judge also takes into account the guy's um, employment history and his appearance. And so does the journalist. The jur journalist starts off with, he's a respectable looking man or words to that effect. Um, so I, I think we're, we're looking at, you know, obviously a miscarriage of justice here but also um, stark evidence of misogyny and gender discrimination in the legal system at the time. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that was quite a striking example. Um, okay, so look, there are two pretty horrible incidents, but they're not all horrible. Some of them are quite funny. So um, yeah, Michael gets called to a, a haunting. Um, yeah, you heard me right, a haunting. There's a, a ghost on Westmoreland Street. Um, so yeah, um, apparently there was about 200 people gathered around uh, Westmoreland Street the other, uh, one of the evenings and um, yeah there had been a, a rumour that there was a ghost or a spirit and uh, in one of the windows um, so that was at number three uh, it says a crowd of some 200 people assembled to stare at the windows in question Sergeant Donahue number 10b uh, knocked at the door uh, but obtained no response but on a couple of occasions a light it is said resembling that uh, proceeding from a bullseye flitted across the window a quantity of good humoured chaff passed on the occasion between the believers and non-believers in the spiritual visitant um, who declined to favour those expecting him with a view of his ghostly embodiment. So uh, I, th I thought that was quite an odd one to put in the paper. Um, and Michael does seem to get into the paper in weird ways. And, you know, he's, he's in there quite a bit. I'm only giving you a, a hint of some of them. Um, but yeah, what, what, I, what I liked about this one was it... Uh, it kind of showed that people were a bit superstitious, but you have the believers and the non-believers on the street. And presumably the only reason Michael was intervened was the number of people on the street, uh, public order kind of idea. So there's about 200 people outside house on Westmoreland Street, um, and, and it wasn't a pub. Um, there's another good one as well, um, another kind of light one, where um, in September 1885, uh, Michael um, and his constables kind of step into a heated row between uh, two bands, there's a band from Limerick and a band from Inchicore. There'd been a, obviously a, a band competition or a music competition. And the Dublin teams had come out on top. And uh, whoever was announcing the, uh, the results had made some mm, pretty marked comments, like, uh, or pretty, pr yeah, pretty pro Dublin comments, let's say. Um, and I think this upset a lot of the country bands. And um, it kind of kicked off and there was a heated row. So, um, it looks like, yeah, the Limerick band and Inchicore band in particular were getting very, very heated. So the, the police had to step in between them to stop them, um, to stop them fighting all over. Like a, a, it was a, a, an award for, I think, a, that particular one was for a cornet solo or something. So, yeah. Um, there's a, a bigger incident, probably the biggest incident in his career um, while he was working um, is the attempted assassination of a man called Sir Frederick Faulkner. Uh, he was recorder of Dublin 
1882. Now, Frederick Faulkner, you might know him from Ulysses. Um, James Joyce uh, included him in there. Um, and I think he's walking into Molesworth Street, into the, uh, into the lodge of the Masons. Um, he, he was basically the chief magistrate of Dublin uh, for um, the end of the 19th century and the, the early years of the 20th. Um, he's known to have made anti-Semitic comments um, in a case which actually involved an ancestor of Dervla Kerwin. I don't know if anyone's seen that. Who do you think you are episode? It's worthwhile watching. Um, and in 1882, an attempt was made on his life in court. Um, and Michael was present was present at that incident. Um, I was going to say, unfortunately, he wasn't, you know, having a go. But, uh, you know, let's not, we, we, won't, we won't joke about those things. Um, so, yeah, this was re reported in most... Uh, newspapers um, across Ireland and the UK, um, but the most detail can be found in the Dublin papers. And there's different accounts as well. A lot of the UK papers, now I haven't done a full analysis on this, I, I had downloaded a lot of these and I lost my files, so I have to go back and do it again. Um, but a lot of the UK papers uh, say the gun misfired, you know, so that the trigger was pulled, but nothing came out. Um, the detailed Irish accounts don't suggest that, they suggest that uh, you know, there was police intervention and no shot was actually fired. Um, the Dictionary of Irish Biography uh, makes reference to this incident. Um, and this is uh, by Patrick, uh, Patrick Gogan. Um, or Gagan. Um, on, on the 27th of July, 1882, an attempt was made on his life at court. This is Frederick Faulkner. Uh, but the bullet missed narrowly. Um, the most reliable evidence I've come across, the bullet there was no bullet. It didn't leave the gun. Um, yeah, so it appears, what, what does appear to have happened is uh, Sergeant Michael Donoghue and Constable Michael Roddy, uh, he was um, from Castle Moor in Mayo, uh, they were in the courtroom and um, they tackled them, or at least that's the story they gave. Um, yeah, so they, they tackled them. Um, there may be a suggestion that um, Roddy was the one who tackled and took the gun out of the guy's hand. And Michael may have pulled rank, um, but I'm still getting to the bottom of it. Um, it there's a few small interesting inconsistencies in the accounts that I, I, I'm still working on. Um, but yeah, basically this chap um, who pulled the gun, he pulled a seven shot revolver out at the end of his trial. He, he was the plaintiff in the trial. So he, he, was, he was coming to get justice for something. He was, um, he was a tutor. And um, yeah, the, the judge dismissed his case. So he got angry and obviously had a gun on him, loaded in five chambers, apparently. And um, yeah, that's, he decided to, to make uh, an attempt to shoot Frederick Faulkner. And that happened in uh, Green Street Courthouse in Dublin. So that was probably the biggest um, event in Michael's career in terms of the most dramatic. Um, and as I say, I'm still getting to the, the bottom of exactly what happened. Um, but after this, um, a few years later, probably from, or maybe from 1892 onwards, I'm not exactly sure when it started, but Michael ends up being a, an inspector attached to the veterinary department in Dublin Castle. Now, he's, my understanding is he's still part of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. He's still ranked as a sergeant, but he has the role of an inspector within the veterinary department, which is part of the Privy Council attached to Dublin Castle. And this institution was responsible for inspecting livestock in the city, making sure laws were followed to safeguard public health. So something very relatable today, except at the time you have to remember that Dublin was full of animals, full of livestock. So you had houses on Kevin Street were producing eggs and butter. Um, you know, the eggs would have had chickens there. I'm assuming there may have been other animals um, on some of those houses, but um, there is, uh, slaughter, slaughterhouses, there's markets for domestic consumption, there's uh, exports uh, happening, so animals, livestock coming up from the country, being stored in Dublin before slaughter, all this sort of stuff, um, and obviously all the horses. So there's like there's massive potential for disease here. So um, there's a, actually there's a book out on this, um, Civilized by, uh, by Beasts by uh, Juliana Edelman, um, that's on your book list as well. I'm actually waiting for my copy to arrive. Um, so I can't give you too much more info yet, but um, but yeah, the place is full of animals. So these laws are quite important. And um, so this kind of fits in with the inherited family tradition that uh, Michael worked in the Dublin cattle market or had a connection to it. 
Um, and it also explains his uh, occupation in his 1911 census records, where he calls himself a, an inspector in the Department of Agriculture, um, which would have taken over um, the duties of the veterinary department. Um, so look, there's numerous reports in the papers of Michael basically fining people um, for not following these uh, health, health regulations. Um, some of them are to do with swine fever and preventing uh, the spread of swine fever. Uh, some are related to uh, pleural pneumonia, uh, um, which is spread by cattle. So um, we're not gonna, I'm not going to read this whole one, but this uh, we come across Mr. Keyes again, that horrible judge who um, was very misogynistic. Because so I think the last time we saw him was 1886, and this is, what date do I have on this? I think you, you can probably see it. I can't because of the sharing thing, but I think it's it's in probably 1892, 93, something like that. So there's an interesting point here where Mr. Keyes actually takes the side of of the the man being um being prosecuted, and um so yeah, the bit I want to read is Inspector O'Donoghue repeated that the cattle should have uh, been branded after five days according to Article Six. Mr. Keyes thought that many of the order, orders in council were like mathematical problems, it was very difficult for the ordinary mind to understand them. So, yeah, I mean, it's probably not a place to judge, but I don't like this guy. But um, I think it's quite interesting that at least he's, uh, I suppose, standing up for the common man against um, complicated legislation. But I, I like that Michael's very much, it's Article 6, read it, you know. Um, and it's funny that this judge, who doesn't, you know, who's, well, been problematic, uh, seems to have a problem with reading basic legislation um, if he finds it difficult. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, let's have, I, I just want to um, talk about how Michael might have actually got that job in the castle as an inspector. Um, Michael had a brother uh, who was also in the DMP and he was in G division, the detective division. Um, so his personal details from the DMP register are there. He was a laborer. Um, he was from Hackettstown in Wicklow, or Moyne was the townland, just where we would expect to see him, um, unlike Michael's, Michael's entry. Um, and he, yeah, he joined B Division first uh, and then moved into G Division. Um, unfortunately, he, he died um, young. Uh, so he dies in 1892, um, in the summer of 1892. And um, if you have a look, there's a notice for his funeral there. So... Um, it has Sergeant Donahue's brother, which is Michael, in attendance. Um, it also has the Chief Inspector, Cooper. Now, keeping in mind that um, G Division were based in the castle, that Michael attended this funeral along with the Chief Inspector. And funnily enough, or well, horrible, but from, the, um, from Michael's death cert, or sorry, James's death cert, um, the fact that he died of uh, thysis, um, which again is one of these diseases that could be spread by livestock. It occurs to me a possibility is that Michael was given the opportunity or had the social capital because of this connection to get that job in um, the Department of the Veterinary. Um, and I suppose it's possible that given, um, given that James died of one of these diseases, that might be linked to it as well. Um, and the, the time seems to link up, but of course, I can't be 100% sure when Michael started. But the earliest reference I have is late summer or, or autumn 1892, and James died early summer 1892. So it seems to be a possibility, um, but it's really hard to say definitively. Yeah. But an interesting idea anyway. Okay, so Michael retires <laughs> eventually um, after all that. Um, and he's uh, pensioned um, in 1898. Um, at a rate of 98 pounds per annum. Again, take these uh, you know, inflation measures with a grain of salt, but that's probably somewhere in the region of 12 to 13,000 Great British pounds today. Um, so yeah, uh, so he was relatively well off, I suppose, you know, as, as pension man. Um, he's still living in uh, Nine Lower uh, Kevin Street at this time. That's confirmed by census records and his electoral lists and indeed by his will when he dies. Um, or his, his, his obit, uh, I think it's in, yeah, it's in his will as well. Um, so yeah, uh, on the 19th of December, um, 1919, this is what, uh, about two decades after he retired, 
uh, Michael is riding his bicycle. So he's quite a fit man, obviously. Um, he's riding his bicycle uh, on the north side um, when he hears uh, shots fired. Um, and it's the day of the IRA's failed attempt to assassinate the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, uh, Sir John French. Um, and basically, uh, if you don't know this story, um, it was an ambush attempt by members of Colin's squad and others, including uh, Dan Breen and Martin Savage, who was killed in the event. And what they were trying to do was set up an ambush, uh, overturn a cart. Uh, they knew French was coming um, with an armoured and armed convoy, and they were going to basically shoot him and assassinate him. Okay? Uh, the Lord Lieutenant being the, the king's representative in Ireland. Okay? Um, so that was, that was the event. And yeah, Michael, uh, Michael's cycling not far away when this happens. So I was very lucky, and I have to thank uh, Dominic Price for giving me his notes on this. Um, I was very lucky to actually get Michael's statement. Um, Michael was questioned about this. Um, so he's basically, um, he's cycling out, of, out around the north side when uh, two lads um, from the squad or, you know, connected with the squad um, and the event um, come down and they mug him for his bicycle and they threaten to shoot him and um, or, or intimate that anyway. And uh, they take his bicycle and they say, I will leave it at the Gresham for you. And um, they don't, they leave it near, about a kilometre away, so not, not too far away. Um, and I think this is worth reading. And there's a few reasons I think this is worth reading. Um, it's his own words transcribed. Um, and there's some really interesting turns of phrases. Uh, nice to hear the voice of a, a Wicklow man from the mid 19th century. So I'm, I'm actually going to read it out loud if nobody minds. Um, I remember Friday, 19th of December, 1919, I was cycling out from Dublin to Ashtown and when near the deaf and dumb institution, Cabra on Navan Road, I heard several loud explosions like field guns and musketry. This was about one o'clock PM. I continued riding out the road, and in about eight or 10 minutes after, I met seven or eight young men, apparently of the shop assistant class, riding bicycles on the footpath coming against me towards the city. In about three or four minutes later, when opposite Roosevelt Cottages, I met two other young men on one bicycle, one of them riding the machine and the other standing on the step behind. I was walking at this time, wheeling my bicycle. And when I met the young men, the one of them who was riding on the step of the machine alighted and gripped my machine at the same time saying, I want this. No, said I, you are not going to get this. The other man who was still on the saddle of his bicycle said, point the revolver at him. I said, is that the way now? And he said, yes, it is. I then parted with my bicycle. The man said he would leave it about the corner of the Gresham Hotel. He then got up on my machine and rode away towards town. I did not see a revolver with either of the men. I then returned to town on foot and walked on towards Fibsborough, but no other cyclist passed me on the way. The two men who took my bicycle appeared to be between 10 and 25 years of age. That might be a typo on my part. It's probably 20 and 25 years of age. Uh, fairly tall and clean shaven. Uh, they wore fawn coats and soft hats. I do not think I would be able to identify them again. My bicycle was afterwards found on the rails um, at the door of MacArthur's office, uh, corner of Talbot Street and Gardner Street, and has since been restored to me by the police. Now, I absolutely love the turn of phrase in, in this. Um, I think it's, it's great. Uh, what does strike me as odd is that he, this is a, a former police sergeant, and he's still compassmentous enough to be cycling around Dublin. And family tradition has to be cycled down to Kildare a bit as well. Um, and he recognises that the shots are like field guns and musketry. Uh, but he cannot, he doesn't think he'd be able to identify the two men who, um, who mugged him. That strikes me as very, very strange. A trained police officer. Um, so you'd wonder if he's making a choice on that one, for whatever reason. Um, there's also no mention of him in this account being a former police officer, uh, but we know it's him because of the address. Um, so yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, okay, so we're almost there. Um, Michael dies, uh, unfortunately, uh, and he Michael dies on the 22nd of December 1922. Um, his funeral is actually two years to the day after he gave that last statement, gave that witness statement, New Year's Day. Um, 1923 and I think the other thing was actually is in three years three years apologies 
I'm a numerate. Um, okay, so uh, his his death made front page news, but that's not uh, not unusual at the time. The obits and the free uh, in the Freeman's Journal were always on the front page, um, but it's it's a fun thing to say. Um, so yeah, he died. Um, he died of pleurisy and bronchitis, um, and that's recorded in a civil death record. And he's buried in Glasnevin with his uh, wife Catherine and a number of their children who actually died young, um, and predeceased him, and and her. And um, yeah, that, that's his uh, headstone there. Um, now, I'm not exactly sure when that was erected. Obviously, it has the earlier burials on it. It might have been erected initially when his first child died, or it might have been when Catherine died, um, or it might have been when Michael died himself, though I, I suspect not. Um, but there's a bit of a statement there to me. Um, I'm trying to get a measure of the man. You know, he's, he's, he was a, a DMP sergeant. He was an agent of the crown, an agent of em empire and oppression and on the one hand. On the other hand, he prosecuted people who probably deserved prosecution for horrible acts, as well as people who probably didn't deserve prosecution for not following, following um, rules, even if the rules were well-meaning. Um, on the other hand, he has this, what, what looks to me like some sort of Gaelic revivalist headstone. Um, the use of his surname changes. Um, it seems from the records I have available that he consciously adopts O in front of his name and changes the spelling of it. I don't know who adds the G. You'd wonder, is that a class thing or is it a, a nationalist thing or a Gaelic revivalist thing? It's really hard to call, but they're just things to consider. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really it. Um, I'm still sketching out the man. I'm still following up more on this and uh, i just wanted to uh bring it to to people um, and i hope this talk has done the following i hope it's illustrated an interconnectedness between family local and social and national history i hope it's acted as an engaging case study showcasing some of the sources that you can use for family and local history research and um, i hope it's facilitated you learning something new and interesting about the history of dublin uh, i hope it's entertained you and that's quite important and i am um, yeah, I, I hope that it's remembered a largely forgotten man who I think led an interesting and significant life. Chris, you're, uh, you're muted, sorry. So thank you, Owen. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. The first question we have in, We're yeah, welcome. I'm muted now. <laughs> uh, first question we have in uh, is from Tara, I believe. Uh, she complimented you on the presentation. She said, uh, without the name, is there a way, uh, how did you identify the police sergeant? She says, without the name identifying, example, Michael in newspaper mm. reports, is there any way of figuring out who the DMP person might be from a reference like Sergeant 10B or Constable yeah. 70B? Absolutely, uh, I actually it doesn't I... correspond in the ledgers. So if you could speak to that, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I meant to, I meant to explain that. Um, so the, the number in the ledger isn't the same as, as the, the number uh, in, in the papers in, in that they're, um, I, I look, I'm not a cop, but I think the, their badge numbers, their lapel numbers, you know, 10B or whatever. Um, but what I could do was um, I could cross-reference um, the database from, there's a database somebody set up really useful, by the way, and I've put a link um, in the PDF um, of, the mem of, of all the people listed in the DMP register. And I was able to make sure that there's no other possible Michael Donoghue or variant of the name who was in that division at that time. Um, so the numbers in um, the numbers in the paper, with like 28A or 10B, whatever it was, um, they all correspond to when Michael was in each of those divisions. The dates are correct. And um, there's no other possibility in, okay. in those cases. Um, it's much easier with Sergeant. Um, if it was constables, you know, it'd be much more difficult. But I, I think I only have one where he's a constable. Um, but that does actually, it just happens that there's no other Michael. It could be. Okay. Uh, we have uh, another question slash comment, and it's about uh, the use of the word bitter. You were talking about the use of the word bitter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Use case. Uh, and they say they think that bitter had different connotations back then, severe or damning in this context, a bitter yeah. row. Uh, rather than sour or churlish as we understand it now, that it was kind of more severe or, or, or damning. 
yeah, that's that was my reading, but I just wanted to throw it out there in case I was being, let's say, subjective, given that yeah. he's my great grandfather. But I, 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 yeah, I would be thinking along the same lines that it was uh, the context of responding to the judge like that, or certainly that's how it's presented by the paper. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's he was probably standing up um, for the uh, the wife. I would think. Yeah, it sounds like my reading as well, but. Uh, other than James, another question in from Linda here. Other than James, did Michael have other siblings? He he did. Um, yeah, he did. Um, he had uh, a brother called Martin. Um, yeah, he had a, a an older sister called Mary. Um, and then he had um he had half siblings because his father remarried, um, and they end up in uh, or a bunch of them end up in London. Um, so I'm just tracking that down. Um, okay. But yeah, there's there's quite a few. Um, so, so there's yeah. a follow up question about uh, his children. Do you find any information on the children in general, or is your research not? Yeah, no, I, I have. Yeah, um, I th so he 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 actually Michael had two families. So I'm from his uh, second family, and I think everyone who survives, um, certainly with the name, um, and I think everyone who survives from him. Is from the second family so when he's uh, retired he after he's a widower um, he he has two boys um with with a younger woman um and yeah i i think his children from the first marriage don't think there's any issue from them okay at all. yeah uh there's a follow-up question from tara just about the uh the constable numbers and stuff mm -hmm. i suppose she says uh when a newspaper mentions no name whatsoever, can Constable B be identified from that? If there's just the number, uh, is there a way to find out who that is? Not to my knowledge, but there may be other records, but not from the general register. Um, oh. the gen yeah, the number in the general register is kind of like, you know, the number entry in the register, not the, not the um, number of the, of the person in that division. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you'd, you'd need to find uh, another source that would have the name. And then, then you're sorted, but not to my knowledge. Uh, I have a question here. I, I know, and for those of you who joined us late today, uh, there is a document that will be emailed out to you. Um, we tried to share it in the chat. It doesn't seem to be opening for people because it's a PDF, but we will be emailing it out to all of the attendees today. Um, and uh, in it, there is a list of resources, I understand, Owen, for people to do their own research. So this question may be answered in that. While you're here, uh, any suggestions, please, for sources of photos of Lower Kevin Street? Uh, they have family connections to numbers six and seven. So I know, for example, you could look at the National Library of Ireland, have a good image collection. Yeah. Uh, Dublin City Council has a great image repository. Um, but then you might you probably know further that UCD is also that their digital portal is a great space, but you'll, I'm sure, be able to answer. Well, as, as primarily a med medievalist, I'm, uh, I'm not au fait with uh, photographic history, <laughs> but uh, I, I would have said the UCD one. All right. Yeah. Um, and also there is a book um, on that list, uh, which is a photographic memoir uh, connected to uh, the Dublin um, DIT on Kevin Street. Um, and there's some photos in that. Yeah, um, yeah. but not not a huge amount either so i would say yeah those I, I would say those databases and you know just generally google images as well and you won't get credits a lot of the time which is yeah. really frustrating but there are some old pictures of kevin street and you might be able to identify or recognize things okay uh we have one here it's it's uh more of a let's see the Online Bureau of Military History statements include a number of accounts of the attempted French assassination. These probably have a bit more regarding the gunman meeting Sergeant uh, Donahue. Oh. Uh, and you, they really enjoyed the talk. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I will have a look at that. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, I, uh, the, the uh, statement I got there came from Q, but I didn't go. It was um, I found a reference to the incident and uh, Dominic Price was, was good enough to give me his notes on it. Um, so yeah, it's something I want to follow up on more. So uh, the Military Bureau, yeah? Uh, yeah, I'll, let me see. I will tell you now. The Online Bureau of Military History. Brilliant. Online Bureau of Military History. Um, where can the RIC records be sourced? Question here. Uh, the RIC records as opposed to the DMP records. Um, 
you can get them on uh, Find My Past, but it's subscription. And um, that's that's how I came across them before. Actually, interesting, funny little uh, uh, coincidence. Um, there's a man who's number 6909, same as my, my Michael in the DMP register, and he's number 6909 in the RIC register, and he's also called Michael Donahue. He's a good bit earlier in the history, um, a few decades earlier, and he's from Galway. So that's a, a coincidences do happen. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, let me see what else we have. Gardy in Dunleary still wear the letter F on their shoulders, harking back oh. to the DMP's F division. Well, that's uh, would you happen to know if this is true of other DMD, uh, DMP divisions, if they still carry forward the same, the same letters that they used to have? It's fascinating. Yeah, I, I really don't know. I, I know uh, very little, I suppose, about police history. Um, it, I only ever approached it because of this, um, because of a family history um, connection. Um, but I, I, that's interesting. If, if the Dunleary police have F, I, I would imagine so. I'll definitely check next time I'm on the street in Dublin. <laughs> I'm just having a look through the chat. There's a lot of great feedback from the talk. People found it fascinating, really interesting. Great talk, really informative. Um, let me see. Fascinating, great talk. Do, 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 do. Uh, great talk, also great. Uh, lots of people with family connections to the DMP as well. Uh, just having a look to see if I've missed a question in here. As someone who knows very little uh, about this myself, if a Dublin sergeant is technically employed by the Crown, are they perceived as representative, uh, representative of the English rule or more so just as an early Gardaí Síochána? And I suppose uh, uh, sort of feeds into a bigger question of what was the perception of this new force like, you know, uh, I imagine it must have been taken a while. Were people on board from the beginning? Did they feel it was needed? And, uh, not, not, not from the beginning. I mean, outside thing coming in or was it, you know? I, I, I think the uh, if, if you remember, I said like before the uh, 1836 uh, Dublin Police Act, there, there'd been kind of attempts to create a force uh, through yeah. legislation and they were unpopular. Um, I'm not sure how politically the unpopular they were in terms of like, you know, Ireland, England. Um, I, I, from the little bit of reading I did on that, um, I, I got the impression that it was more to do with um, the cost of it. Okay. Um, and the bureaucracy attached to, to it. Um, but you're not aware of like a big nationalist uh, resistance to it on the basis that, you know, it was... It was no, uh, I haven't come across it, but I, I, I wouldn't, given what I was looking at, you know. Um, it's, it's a great question, but I, I yeah, I, I wouldn't have come across it, I'm afraid. Uh, just a question here. I was always told my granduncle was in the RIC during the Civil War. Now I'm wondering, was it the, the DMP? What's the difference in these two organisations? Yeah, they're just two separate police forces. Um, and the DMP, I mean, they're very similar, um, but the DMP was uh, responsible for Dublin and the RIC was responsible for the rest of the country. Um, so if you have a look, bear with me. <coughs> Pardon. Um, if you have a look at the uh, DMP register um, and the database in that PDF that will be emailed around, um, you might find uh, your uncle in there. Um, there's a couple of typos in that database. I say it's a database. It's an ex Excel spreadsheet with searchable content, um, but it's, it's very useful. Um, so okay. have a look in there. And if not, find my past uh, .ie. If you do a subscription, you can get access to the RIC um, records and their search function will help. I see Tara has uh, let us know in the top box there that if anyone is interested in the RIC, the, uh, the website irishconstabulary.com uh, may be of interest. And there's also a section dealing specifically with the DMP. Uh, so there's a link to that in the chat. Uh, if people want to have a look in the chat rather than the Q&A at the end, you will see uh, that Tara has posted a link where you will find uh, both uh, information on the RIC and the DMP. Uh, let me see. When did that come in? Yeah, there's a question here. I think you j just touched off it really, or I think you just covered it a moment ago, but was there general support from the dubs for the DMP? Uh, and 
I, I think you covered that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't look at that, to be honest. Um, you know, I know at the very start, when the police force was beginning to be legislated for, there, there was a kickback against it. But um, I'm sure attitudes would have changed over time as well. Like, certainly by the early 20th century, there seems to be. There is something interesting, actually, in that. So with Michael, his, um, <coughs> pardon, if you look at his 1901 and 1911 census records, you see that he, he gives a different occupation in both. He gives ex-DMP sergeant, ex-sergeant DMP in his 1901, and he gives uh, inspector in the Department of Agriculture in 1911. Now, if the man's retired in 1989, the choice to put in his occupation there, unless he went back to do work later on after retirement, um, but I, I don't see that uh, at that age. Um, it looks to me like his choice to put in his occupations there <coughs> has to do with something else, a sense of identity. And okay. it, might, it might be that personally he didn't want to be associated with the DMP. Now, it could, could be loads of different reasons for that in the very early 1900s, uh, certainly around 1911, let's say. Um, but of course, his, his obituary after he's dead, um, his, presumably his, his son, Michael, um, you know, wrote that. Um, but in that he is he called a, an SDMP sergeant. So it, it's, but I, I still think that's an interesting choice for me. And I, I wonder if there's something there. But look, I, I don't know is the answer. Okay. Well, I think just have a moment for any more questions to come in. I think that might be it for today. So first of all, thank you, Owen. I'd like to thank Owen, um, Owen uh, Odunaku. Uh, and everyone who took part in today's Dublin History Festival talk.